This is our next talk coming up. It's Sophia Zeli with the State of Digital Rights in Latin America. Sophia, up to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in today. Um, as it was said, my name is Sophia Selly and I'm a cryptographic researcher, mainly a cloudflare, but I also led the development of the Optera of the record messaging protocol in its version 4. And on my spare time, I also research about the state of the digital rights in Latin America. And specifically, I research around uh, the usage of digital tools to enhance gender-based violence in Latin America specifically. But today, uh, I was wanting to talk to you about the state of digital rights in Latin America. And this is a really big topic, uh, so I will try to just cover the basics of all of it. Um, so don't expect that much in depth of, uh, of the topics that I'm going to talk about is more of an outline, so people are more aware of the state of it. So let's start with one of the most uh, interesting questions. We're talking about the state of the digital rights in Latin America, to actually talk about what is Latin America. And for some people, maybe on the audience, this would be really simple to just, uh, because people already have a preconceived notion of what Latin America is. But actually to Latin Americans, so for people living in South America or Central America or the Caribbean or the South or North America, this is not an easy question because there's a lot of um, questions around when actually Actually, Latin America was created as a concept and what actually means as a concept to be a Latin America. Does it actually mean to have uh, some certain uh, cultural background that is shared between each other? What does actually does this mean? And in actually in certain parts of what some people will actually uh, think is Latin America, some people on it actually don't think they belong to Latin America because sometimes they're associated to be part of Latin America, to have, to have a background of uh, being colonized by European powers and also have an indigenous background. And as there's racism in Latin America as everywhere in the world, certain people in Latin America that think themselves as white don't want to belong of Lat to Latin America because of the reasons. So speaking of Latin America, as I'm not sure it's a controversial topic in itself in Latin America itself, but on this talk I'm going to speak about and be referring to the Latin American region, specifically to countries belonging to, the, to South America, to Central America and the Caribbean, and to the South of North America, mainly uh, to Mexico. And when I talk about Latin America as a region, I'm not including French Guiana, because that's part of the La France de haute mer and it's part of the Schengen area. So that's the first uh, question that now sort of have been answered, at least uh, for this talk. And to actually give a little bit of background on why I think it's actually important to talk about the state of digital rights in Latin America, it's uh, mainly one of the reasons why I wanted to give this talk at CCC was mainly because sometimes in these kind of conferences we, we hear a lot about the state of digital rights mainly in the global north, but sometimes we are oblivious to actually what is happening in the global south and if the same kind of a state or the same kind of ideas and notions that we have for digital rights apply the same to the global south. And in this case I'm just going to be focusing specifically on one region of the global south, mainly Latin America, but uh, there will be needed actually more research and more actually people talking about other regions of the global south. And to give a little bit of historical context of why it's actually important to talk about digital rights in Latin America, I was wanting to actually uh, start with this specific historic instance of something that happened in Latin America. And the reason why I'm going to highlight this specific instance is because sometimes we think that um, this kind of surveillance or this kind of um, censorship of the kind of um, of the kind of going against uh, human rights only happens sometimes in the global north because we sort of associated that the transgression between um, that the transgression between um, between dig uh, towards digital rights only happens between spies and like big countries, but that's not actually the case. And in this historical context, I'm going to show you why it also happens uh, sort of in Latin America. Uh, so what is the scene? The scene right now is um, the Cold War, uh, the Cold War, and this is basically this historical instance in which there were two superpowers basically fighting for economic, political, 
and even cultural, I would say, um, uh, around the world. And the two superpowers were the Soviet Union and the United States of America. During that time, during the 70s and the 80s, Latin America uh, sort of elected certain socialists, and I put socialists in quotes, socialist government to be the representatives of the people. And I said socialist because sometimes we have a specific notion of what socialism is, but it was in a specific notion of socialism in the Latin American context. So these governments were actually elected, uh, but certain other powers that exist also in the Americas didn't actually like that uh, these governments were elected, or even they didn't like what happened in Cuba, mainly the uh, Cuban revolution. So in order to prevent uh, for all the Latin American countries turning completely socialist, what happened is that the United States backed a campaign of political repression and state of terror involving intelligence operation and assassination of opponents, uh, mainly in Latin America. And in fact, the deposition of many of the socialist governments um, uh, that were elected in Latin America. And this uh, backed campaign of political repression happened in several countries in Latin America, mainly in Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, and Peru. And the involvement of the United States was not only about backing them economically, but they actually provided uh, planning, military cooperation, uh, training on torture, technical support, and supply military aid. And this happened uh, during various administrations of the, of the United States, mainly during the administration of Johnson, Nixon, Paul, Carter, and Reagan. This not only happened between cooperation between these Latin American countries and the United States, but it's also happened between uh, the same Latin American countries. So the same countries that I just mentioned also cooperated between each other to provide themselves with actual good planning on how to efficiently torture and efficiently kill political opponents uh, to the regimes that were installed by the United States against the socialist governments. Uh, during the 70s and the 80s, not much was known actually in how actually these operations were actually carry out. Of course, it was known that a lot of people were killed and a lot of people were disappeared and a lot of people were tortured. But it was only until December of 1992 that Martin Almada and Jose Agustin Fernandez Drove to, an obscure, drove to an obscure police station in the suburb of La Mare in Asuncion, in Paraguay. And what they, why they drove into this station was because a whistleblower actually sketched out um, the plan of where this uh, police station was. So they drove to it, and what they found is that they found a cache of seven, 700,000 documents piled near to the ceiling of something that later was going to be called the Terror Archive. Los Archivos del Terror, which was a complete paper database of the interrogation of records of interrogation, torture, and surveillance that was conducted under the military dictatorship of Alfredo Stroessner, which was the Paraguan, uh, Paraguayan uh, dictatorship during the military intervention of Latin America. What they found out is that mainly it was used uh, informants, telephoto cameras, watch apps to build this paper database of everyone that was viewed as a threat. And I highlight here that there was everyone that was viewed as a threat was not actually only people who were actually deemed to be actual political opponents to the military regimes during those times, but it was mainly everyone that they thought was actually uh, some kind of threat. It could have been an artist uh, creating art that was against the regime. It could have been students that for some reason decided to read Karl Marx. So all of these people that somehow were associated with socialism or somehow were deemed to be opponents of the regime in that time were, um, targeted as threats. And it was not only them, but also the friends and their associates. So they created a database of not only the people that they think they were a threat uh, to the military regime, but also of any kind of friend or any kind of family that they had. The archive was a total of 60,000 documents and weighed four tons and, comp and it compromised uh, 593,000 microfilm pages. The result of all of this and of all of the database and all of all of this torture and all of these killings was that up to 50,000 people were killed, 30,000 disappeared, and 400,000 were arrested and imprisoned. And until this day, if you go to any of the countries that I have just mentioned, you will see several instances and several families of actual of people. Um, or relatives of people who were actually disappear. And until these days, there's a lot of countries in which a lot of people still ask for the bodies of the people who disappear, or at least to know what happened to the people to disappear. 
So why I'm speaking about this, the reason why I'm speaking about this is because we sometimes think that these things don't happen at this level, that people don't get disappeared because there exists a paper database of you that, uh, that showcases yourself as a threat. For some reason, for whatever reason, just because you somehow read some book that uh, someone deemed that it should be unacceptable to be read during that, that time, which was what happened in Latin America at that, that time. And the other reason why I'm showcasing this is because sometimes we think that countries only surveil their own citizens. Well, this is not true. It was even true in the 70s and the 80s that several different countries that had military governments at that time were surveilling the citizens of other countries. And these countries were sharing these databases between each other. And the other reason why I'm highlighting this is because this was not like a um, stall or solitary operation that was happening because these Latin American countries decided to do it. This was backed up and actually planned by the United States. It is well known and the victims of the torture have actually stated several times that, for example, that they, when they were being tortured, uh, there was always the presence of a United States person in the room actually training people on how to efficiently torture, training people on to how to efficiently track people, training people on how to efficiently create these database. What will happen today? Today will be that this uh, kind of paper databases that existed at that time will be much more efficient because people are using the digital tools um, every day. And it will be the same that they will be backed by some um, power, some uh, more powerful country that will have an interest in the economic and political um, scenario of several different countries. So today, this much, they will be much worse. But the reason why I wanted to highlight this is to actually show you an historical instance when indeed this happened and that it could indeed happen in the future as well. So what's the theme when talking about the digital rights of Latin in Latin American countries? In this talk, I decided to talk about four main topics that I think are really important when talking about digital rights in a region. The first one is to talk about what kind of privacy laws exist on those countries. The second one is talking about the types of cohesion that exist in these countries uh, by the using or by the usage of digital tools. Uh, the third one is to talk about the state of surveillance of those countries. And the fourth one is to actually talk what kind of secure communication are actually provided in those countries. So let's just start with the first one, which is actually the privacy laws. And on this, um, since uh, the arrival of GDPR has been like a hot topic for now some years, but indeed this is not something that just was just created by the arrival of GDPR, but indeed, for example, in the human rights, it's actually defined, privacy is actually defined as a human right. And because of this, most of Latin American constitutions actually uh, provide some certain kind of protection uh, towards privacy because it's part of the human rights. Um, most, mostly in the past, the Constitution have, was only focusing on privacy as part of the non-digital world, but as with the arrival of the digital world, privacy is also applied to the digital world. Since 2010, well, well, 62 new countries have enacted data protection laws, and every country, as, have, as I have said, in Latin America has some form of private uh, data protection. In Latin America, the first country to actually have a privacy law um, uh, was Chile in 1990, 1999, followed by Uruguay, Mexico, Peru, Colombia, Brazil, although in Brazil I would put an asterisk, asterisk because even though it was created in 2018, some parts of the law still need to be debated on um, August 2021. And some parts of the law were actually vetoed by the current president, and there has been some pushback around that law for a while now. Other countries that have actually a privacy law are Barbados and Panama. One of the questions that you can ask yourself when actually talking about privacy laws in Latin America, if this is actually a phenomenon in itself, or it's just like something that has been inspired because of the arrival of GDPR. In most of the cases uh, that we have actually seen, it's actually mostly inspired by GDPR because it's mostly what is right now in fashion, so to say. Um, but it actually needs to actually happen still a lot of research to actually say that this is a phenomenon of their own or that these privacy laws are actually thinking of the reality of Latin America on their own and not just taking some other privacy laws from other countries. So the first question that actually needs to be addressed when talking about privacy laws in the Latin American concept is context itself, is to talk about what is privacy itself. And this is something that now scholars and researchers are actually talking much more uh, around in the sense that even though for one region privacy uh, will mean something because of the cultural background of this region, for another region maybe privacy will not be deserved 
the same because of the different culture meaning of privacy depending on the region of the world that you're talking about. Um, so for example, something that still needs to be researched is what actually means, uh, what, me what privacy actually means for a Latin American context. What does Latin America actually think of privacy itself? The other thing that actually um, gets a lot of talking when you're talking about privacy laws is what actually applies to privacy. If privacy is only the contents of communication that gets uh, the, status of, the status of being private, or if anything, for example, the network transmissions are actually also part of privacy. And this is something that's still um, been talked around. The same when, to when talking about privacy laws in Latin America, actually thinking about what, what data is defined as private, as I have said, and what about metadata or subscriber data, and what about linked data? Metadata is usually what they say is, uh, they usually define it as like auxiliary data that gets created during, for example, having a conversation. Subscriber data, sometimes they define it as the auxiliary data that the initiator actually created. And linked data is more about this data that can actually be linked to an individual and used, for example, for advertisement. Several of the different laws in several Latin American countries have different uh, approach to all of these um, definitions, but most of them uh, are mainly inspired by the same GDPR definitions. What about anonymous data? Certain of the privacy laws indeed have, uh, in Latin America, indeed have some kind of mention of anonymous data. I think in the Brazilian one, for example, they say that anonymous data should be, pri should be private if by some reason, for example, you are able to de-anonymize de the data by using the same mechanism that the service that anonymizes the data uh, use, you manage to de-anonymize it, and then the data is also considered private. But if, like for example, you took the data um, created by some service, and you later, by using a completely different mechanism than the one provided by the service, you manage to de-anonymize it, then that, that data is not private anymore. And this is sort of mentioned a little bit like in a vague terms, but at least it's there. Um, so I just wanted to highlight these questions in the sense to actually say that most of the time when you read the privacy uh, laws of different Latin American countries, the sort of notions that sort of vaguely defined or sort of vaguely uh, mentioned, but not that much going in depth of the different notions. One important thing to actually think about when talking about Latin American privacy laws is what about the data that, the, that gets sent or transmitted to other countries? Because one of the realities of Latin America is that there are some studies that provide, uh, uh, that provide certain kind of services in Latin America that are Latin American itself, meaning that they are like uh, companies that were created in the Latin American countries and where the data is stored in the same country. But most of the time in Latin America, uh, the consumers of applications mainly use social media that is created in other countries and where the data goes to another country or communication systems that go to another country. Most of the privacy laws in Latin America, uh, Latin America actually, says that, actually says that if the data gets transmitted to another country, that uh, this other country should have the same level of protection as the one that is uh, given in the, in the owner's country. But even though this is said in most of the privacy laws, in practice this actually does not happen. And until this day, I have not actually seen um, anyone actually asking any of the companies that we use for social media or for communication to actually surrender the data or to say that they are not applying the same level of protection that Latin American laws provide for their own data. So that is still, it's kept on the law, but in practice, not much happening. Um, another question that you should ask yourself when talking about privacy laws is what about the data that is already stored? So one of the things is that even though this data, uh, these privacy laws exist, even though they existed for some long time, um, still certain uh, countries and uh, certain companies in other countries have been storing this data for a really long time. And we don't know uh, if there will be at any point any kind of request to actually say, yes, to render the data of all our citizens that you have uh, stored for this amount of time. That doesn't have happened so far. Now let's talk about the second topic that I was uh, outlining in the, uh, the introduction. The second topic is the times of cohesion. What kind of cohesion actually exists in Latin America in, Latin America in regards to digital rights and in regards specifically to freedom of expression of the current state of what happened in COVID-19 and about gender-based violence by using uh, digital tools? 
So the same first thing about the health system and COVID-19. So in this, um, this is a really complex topic, but I will just try to highlight certain points uh, about instances in which uh, digital tools are being used to actually diminish the rights that people have to other things. Specifically, some digital tools have been used to diminish the right of people to health, to the health system and to the education system. So in one instance of this happening, for example, is by the usage of biometrics, which is on a rise in Latin America, specifically in Chile and in Brazil. Um, one of the proposals, for example, for Chile was to, to use biometrics uh, during health checks, meaning that you will have access to certain public systems and, some, and to, certain, um, to, certain, to certain health checks only by surrendering the, surrendering the, the biometrics of yourself. So, and this actually doesn't apply to the Latin American um, region in the sense that, for example, in the rural areas, most of the people that were asked to surrender the fingerprints because they work the field or because they sometimes have some kind of disabilities, the fingerprints could not be read because there was no fingerprint or because the fingerprint was really difficult to be read. What this means is that the health system became unfair in itself because the people who were not able to access a health system anymore because they could not really surrender the biometrics because the idea of biometrics didn't match the current reality. And this is uh, something that we will talk during this talk quite a lot, that sometimes in Latin American governments, they take one technology because they think it's cool or is what other countries right now are using, but they don't thinking of what it means to actually apply this technology in a Latin American reality. Another instance in which biometrics are actually abused in Latin America, and this is an abuse that is happening not because of Latin American governments, or maybe it is in a way, but mainly because when Latin Americans have to travel to another country for tourism or for working or for whatever reasons, they usually have to apply for a visa for the Schengen area or for the United States. And most of the times they are asked to surrender the biometrics at the time of applying for the visa, or sometimes at the, at the time of, of, uh, of crossing the border. Order. It's not really known what happens uh, with the biometrics of the people who are, are, are being asked to surrender them for the visas or the legality of actually of all of this. Um, it's not known where is this stored and in some instances even uh, when you are surrendering your application for your visas and surrendering your biometrics, you're also asked to sort of surrender your social media um, in the sense that most of the times, uh, in order to be guaranteed to be given a visa, you have to sort of know that your social media is going to be examined uh, and it's going to be checked that you don't have anything that the country that you're willing to travel to deems um, bad. But coming back to the health system, uh, sometimes in the health system, for example, uh, the reason why, for example, Latin America use it, uh, social media quite a lot is because sometimes the social media is the only option that they have. And this you will see in a few slides uh, that I will talk about this in the future, that sometimes because uh, Latin America has an unfairness between what kind of discourse gets pushed in the, in the mass media, what happens is that minorities usually go to social media to actually try to put uh, themselves in the discourse or to actually uh, have support from other people or to showcase what kind of fairness is happening to them, which is, um, which is bad in itself because this is the only way that they can publish what is happening to themselves. And at the same time, they are surrendering, surrendering their information to social media companies that exist in other countries. So in the case of the health system, for example, this happens quite a lot uh, with people who are, who are HIV positives in the sense that because they don't have a support from the local governments, from the local Latin American governments, they use social media to actually find psychological support or to find any kind of support or, or, or even to actually find any way to buy the medicine that they need because the government is not providing the medicines that they need, what they do is that they have created their own market in which they can uh, buy the medicines that they need because the government is not providing these. What in reality this uh, makes is that uh, there's an on, there is an unregulated market for medicines and there's extortion and of course there's data that is being stored in the social media of these companies that exist outside of Latin America about the health status of the people uh, suffering from, from this. The same happened during COVID-19, in which mainly all of the health system of all Latin American countries collapsed, 
And what happened is that there was a lack of medicines and people started selling uh, medicine again through social media um, or oxygen tanks or other kind of ways. That's the only way that people could actually sometimes get medicines through the usage, usage of social media. And this again poses the question that this was the only way that people could actually access the health system. And at the same time, they were giving away the private information and the health information to companies that exist outside of the Latin American countries because it was the only way in which they could access some kind of health um, checks. Just to give you an example, in uh, a specific example, and a study in 2019 uh, showcased that in Ecuador, 10.7% uh, of people between the ages of 15 and 49 are defined as digital illiterates. And only 41.4% uh, has access to a smartphone. And there's more access to smartphones and in general to the internet in urban areas. And there's more access to smartphones from men than from women and other genders. Uh, this is really important to highlight, especially when talking about COVID-19, because one of the proposals that the Latin American governments have had is that in order to know uh, how much people have been infected with COVID, uh, you should install an application on your phone that actually tracks uh, your movements. And this, of course, has privacy implications for your um, the data around your location, but it also doesn't really make sense in a Latin American scenario because most of the people don't actually have a smartphone. So actually asking people to install an application for COVID-19 when they don't have a smartphone or asking people to start a, an application uh, to, for example, a schedule health checks um, doesn't make sense in Latin America and just uh, makes it wider the the unfairness of the health system itself and this is again an example of the unfair of the ideas that sometimes local uh, latin american governments have that they just see that other countries are actually uh, creating application for tracking the covid 19 but it doesn't really make sense into a latin american reality and um, so yeah on another topic sort of related to cohesion and unfairness uh, is gender-based violence. So when a study of the World Health Organization in 2002 uh, showcased that the gender-based violence is the main cause of death of women in the world, and that 23% of, of women worldwide have reported some kind of digital gender violence. For an example, in the Latin America context itself, in Ecuador, uh, every 71 hours, some woman is killed. And it's these women that get killed in Ecuador, it's not because someone, for example, was trying to steal something from them, but they were killed because they were women. So this is often times called a femicide. Latin American countries are, are pretty much sexist. Um, so, um, as I said, most of the minorities in Latin America don't have a way to express their struggles or to gather support through mass media or through the or through the discourse or to the main discourse that happens in the countries. So what they do is that they switch to social media or any other kind of digital tool to sort of empower the struggle that they are living. But what happens is that um, because they have been using social media or they have been using digital tools, some other groups have actually targeted them uh, through the internet and actually surveilled the, their usage of social media. They have, um, they have created um, strategies for hate speech, unauthorized discrimination of intimate images, cyber sexual harassment, trafficking, expropriation of their identity and censorship. So if you talk to any person or activist who's actually working on gender-based um, activism or in LGBTI plus uh, activism, you will see that they are always targeted uh, by the usage of social media. And there's actually, uh, on some instance that I talked to some activists, there was actually a showcase that um, right-wing uh, parties and right-wing people actually create training on so how, uh, how to actually harass um, activists uh, by using social media. One important case to highlight here, and it's again from Ecuador, is the case of Juliana Campo Verde, which is a woman that was killed uh, by an, a Christian pastor. And what this Christian pastor did was that he hacked into the social media of this woman to actually try to convince the family that she was not disappeared. Um, and this was actually at the beginning not even taken into account by the court, but later by, um, by actually, by pressuring it, it was actually taken into account. 
As I said, mainly uh, the people, the minorities who actually try to uh, be actively um, actively uh, fight for the rights of women or LGBTA plus A in Latin America get a lot of hate speech. They always get the threat, sharing of the photography, uh, monetary commenting, reporting every post. Uh, they send them masturbation videos of men. Uh, and what also happens, and in one instance that I was um, helping one woman, for example, all of their photographies were taken from the social media and it is specific men created art based on them and that was uh, sexual, uh, of sexual nat nature of these uh, photographies that uh, this person took uh, from her account and that happens all the time. And most of the time when um, women or other groups actually try to publicly say that this is what is happening to them or they go into the judicial system to say that this is happening to them and that it's unfair and illegal, most of the time they are diminished because they say that this, this is just hysteria of women. In the cases of grooming, um, this specifically happens in Latin America for teenagers and for children. And what the research has shown is that it happens through the usage of social media for teenagers and the usage of games uh, for children. One important thing to note here is that in most of Global North countries, uh, it has been said that one of the reasons why we should break end-to-end -end encryption of certain secure messaging application is because they're trying to find child predators that have uh, or child sexual harassments uh, that operate at a level that sometimes is international. And while it's true that sometimes they find the sexual predators, um, what happens is that this person gets locked or something similar, but not really a reparation for the people who were harassed in global South countries. So. Yeah, and as I said, um, there's massive attacks against uh, people uh, fighting for rights specific to gender. Uh, in one instance, for example, we know that they were even giving like training sessions for how to censor uh, people, activists that, that were working in gender-based uh, rights. For example, there was one instance in which they were given seminars on how to efficiently target and how to efficiently um, send like memes and create sexual imagery of this person so they will silence themselves in their activist um, plans. So the goal is always to silence and intimidation. In the specific context of domestic gender-based violence, it doesn't happen as it is often highlighted in the global north, that it happens often by installing, for example, more in the cell phones or in the devices of the victims. That doesn't happen a lot. What happens most of the times is that the passwords uh, get stolen by either by cohesion or either because the person sort of guessed. Um, or what also happens is that most of the time in domestic abuse cases, what happens is that the perpetrator will take away the devices of the victim. They will take away their computer or their smartphones or whatever they have um, instead of uh, to isolate the victim. So it's not much more about installing malware as it is in global North countries. But in this case, there's a lot that is actually missing and there's a lot of research that is needed around the topic. There's a lot of research to actually call this as it is. This is actually uh, targeted surveillance, uh, even though some people have actually not call it that way because they say that this is just uh, this is just activists being targeted or this is just activists that are complaining too much or this is, you know, the state of the world in which um, obviously if you're a feminist, you will get all of these targeted um targeted harassment, but that's not true. This is actually, what the research has actually shown in Latin America is that this is uh, actually targeted harassment around groups. So there are seminars who actually train to how to efficiently do this. There are Facebook groups and private WhatsApp groups with, in which the social media of, uh, of activists is shared and people are encouraged to sexually harass or harass in any way these people. Um, it's something that is missing and it's an interesting research to actually do is to actually find out how the campaign of the homosexualization clinics happen in Latin America. They are usually happening in over social media. What, are, what is the homosexualization clinics? It's basically some clinics that exist in Latin America that they say there are clinics for uh, drug-related uh, drug issues so you re recover your drug addiction. But in reality, what they are is that there are clinics in which 
LGBTIA plus uh, people are actually kidnapped and tortured until they become straight. What actually means becoming straight, I don't know, but they are actually tortured. In many cases, they are raped, and this happens all over Latin America. And the way that uh, these uh, clinics are showcased or advertised is through the usage of social media. So it will be really interesting to show, to have a research around how, what actually are the strategies that these people are uh, making by the usage of digital tools. And the same for abortion clinics, and I put abortion clinics in quotes because abortion is mostly legal, illegal in Latin America with the exception of Uruguay and since yesterday in Argentina. Um, but what they do is that sometimes in university forums, uh, in social media, they advertise these abortion clinics, which are not really abortion clinics, but are like just... Um, places where women go to think to have a safe abortion, but it's actually places where they either convince women to not abort or like try to kidnap them so they don't abort. Um, this will be an interesting research to actually do. And if you want to know more details about gender-based violence and how it's actually executed in Latin America, have an upcoming, upcoming talk in Enigma around specifically this. But let's move on uh, to another topic. And the topic is surveillance, as I said, uh, when talking about activists, uh, women's activists, and LGBTI, and LGBTIA plus activists, and um, and certain of uh, different different activists, I have already said that these kind of minorities get all the time uh, targeted surveillance. Even if people don't want to call it uh, surveillance itself, it is in itself surveillance of these groups and targeted harassment of them. But uh, to the most classical surveillance that people have in their mind, the surveillance that is either mass surveillance or targeted surveillance of political opponents and uh, human rights activists, let's talk it now in this point. So about surveillance is also a question that has been asked when talking about privacy laws in Latin America. And one of the interesting debates that happened around that time was what is surveillance? If it's only like, um, if you have the data of someone and you're reading it as a human, is that surveillance or that also includes, like for example, if there's machine reading, meaning that if it's some bot gathering your information and later creating advertisement based on it, is that surveillance or not? And there's just still some ongoing debate around that. I really like uh, the definition made by EFF in this report, which is really good, so you should read it if you're interested, in which that it's not, surveillance is not only about private communication, reading private communication of another human being, but also collecting, monitoring, intercepting, analyzing it, using, preserving it, reta uh, retaining it. So. And what I like about this definition is also that it says past, present, or future, because surveillance is not only about what is right now happening, but also how much it has happened in the past. In Latin American legality in itself, Latin American governments oftentimes allow some form of white happiness or surveillance in the face of uh, crime. In many of the definitions that I have found, um, they allow in the face of crime if this is a serious crime, if it's terrorism or is it to aid an investigation. What exactly is a serious crime is not actually defined, um, or when does a crime become serious? Um, what actually defines terrorism itself sometimes is not actually properly defined, or when to aid an, in aid an investigation is actually a good case for actually having what happened is actually also not really defined. Measures of other means of surveillance is not really there. Uh, so, for example, there's not really an instance in when they say that more way installation is allowed. But in practice, as you will see in a few slides, that actually occurs. And most of the times when there is more way that is being installed to target uh, political opponents or human rights activists, it's oftentimes more way on software that is sold by global north companies, which uh, opens up many questions that I will um, cover in a few minutes. In the case of location tracking, also some kind of access is provided depending on the Latin American country. In Colombia, for example, just to give an example, it is required that telecommunication services, um, the two main ones in Colombia, Claro and Movistar, and network providers hand over location data to authorities. In Ecuador, it's actually really <laughs> easy to get location data about someone. It was an instant, for example, if you go to the police and you say that someone is disappeared, they will actually turn location tracking for that person in order to find it pretty easily. Um, but something that is oftentimes found in most of the laws of Latin America is that, well, it says that authorities are 
can get access to location tracking. There's no clear distinction around which authorities actually have access to this location tracking, or even more if the authorities share between other authorities, how is the sharing actually happening? That's not really defined. In the case of Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Mexico, Peru, and Honduras, they all have data retention obligation, which uh, requires that they log vast amounts of data about the users and prov provide law enforcement access to it if they need it. In the case, for example, of a trade and investigation of, 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 or of a serious crime. Um, in practice, um, this is really oblivious and opaque to the user. Sometimes there's sometimes some kind of notification that says that if you're using a service, this data is locked. But most of the time, the user don't really know that this is indeed happening. And if you ask an everyday person in Latin America, if they know that their data could be potentially used later for to aid an investigation or that it could be given the authorities, most of the people will not really actually know that that's indeed what is happening. And again, there's no clear distinction around which authorities have actually access to it. Let's talk about in general about the question of surveillance, if there's actually mass surveillance in Latin America. What it has been shown that it in contrast to the global north, there's not this traditional instance of mass surveillance in the sense that there have not been really that much leaked documents that showcase that there's a plan from the government to actually surveil all the citizens at this scale. Um, but there has been very much instances of uh, targeted surveillance. Um, it could be, and it's but it's mainly reasonable to say that there could be mass surveillance, but at least some, so far we have not had that much of examples of it. Some notable examples of actual targeted surveillance are the software uh, installed by Colombia that's called Esperanza, and the other one that was sold by Berin System that is called Puma, and this was an spy software um, for telecom communi telephone communication. Uh, and it was targeted towards journalists, political opposition parties, human rights activists, and this was all done during the Alvaro Uribe's government um, in Colombia. Most of the time, the software, or the reason why they try to justify that they bought this more and they bought this software is because they try to help anti-kidnapping operation, anti-extortion operation, anti-terrorism, anti-drug trade. And this is a common thing all over the world, that the reason why they say that they break into end encryption or that they need to buy more is because they're trying to aid criminal investigation or some kind. Citizen Lab and the Canada Center for Global Security Studies Monk School of Global Affairs actually revealed the existence of command and control servers from Team Spy, the Gamma International Team Fisher Remote Nutrition Surveillance Software, in Mexico and Panama, in Venezuela and Paraguay. And of course, the spyware was developed by a German-based uh, company. And the same happened in, with the hacking team in other countries, mainly in Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Ecuador, Honduras, Mexico, and Panama. Panama. And it was the same. It was mainly targeted to political opponents. It was targeted to human rights activists. It was targeted for journalists. Um, how it was bought, that raises a lot of questions of why the Global North countries and these companies were actually selling this uh, malware to governments. In the legality of it, these companies uh, couldn't actually sell it uh, as it is. Um, so they tried to find a legal way to actually sell it. The way that they found it is by using a intermediate intermediaries, uh, mainly, for example, in the case of Ecuador, there was a, a Colombian-based company that, that was the one that was uh, buying the software from the, from the Global North companies and then reselling it uh, to Colombia and Ecuador. Another question is if it was safe to use in the sense, was this, this malware really doing tr uh, only spying on the political opposition or whatever they wanted to spy, and it was not backfiring and also logging data of the Latin American governments or the, of the people that were inspired. As we know now, it was also doing that. So there was not even a notion of the governments that bought this of what actually they were buying. And what about sovereignty? What about actually buying another software uh, from another country to actually spy on your citizens? Um, that raises a lot of questions. In the case of secure messaging, uh, what we have found is that there's not a lot of usage of actual secure messaging in the sense of traditional secure messaging application that exists today. In the case of Signal or in the case of Wire, um, mainly people in Latin America use social media. If they're activists, they mostly use social media because that's the only way, as they don't have access to mass media, the social media gives them a way to access um, 
to have a way to publish what they are doing in some kind of way. And the, the way that, for example, they operate, how they are going to create meetings or what kind of a strategy they are developing is through the usage of WhatsApp groups. There's not much use of Signal that I've known of, known of because it's not so known because it's too slow. Um, specifically, when I have spoken with journalists in Latin America, they sometimes have told me that they don't use it because it's too slow, because people cannot really send documents to Signal because it will take forever, because it's too difficult to use, when people say it, and mostly because contacts do not use it. So most of the people don't really use Signal, and so therefore they don't really use it. If your family or your friends don't use it, then you will not use it also. Something that is really used is Telegram um, because they have sort of a marketing campaign for um, Latin American activists. So most of Latin American groups actually use Telegram. All the secure messaging communication systems are hardly used. You hardly see people actually using OTR or PGP because they are much more difficult to install. So not really that much used. Um, and what often happens, specifically if you're talking activists about that uh, fight for indigenous rights, is that they often don't have uh, enough economic uh, advantage to actually buy lots of the smartphones and put signal into it, or buy a lot of computers. What they do is that oftentimes they have one desktop computer and they share it between each other because that's what they can. Um, so in these cases, there's not a really good solution for secure messaging for them. There's one instance in which you can actually say that um, there's a country who has actually asked um, WhatsApp to actually surrender uh, encrypted data of someone to aid an investigation. And in this case, it was Brazil between 2015 and 2016. And because uh, WhatsApp refused to provide this data, it was blocked uh, during that time, which to this day, there's still uh, some debate about the legality of actually blocking it or not. So as I'm running out of time, let's go uh, directly to, to some conclusions. So in conclusion, there's a still need a lot to, to actually think about Latin America in terms of the digital tools and the privacy of them and the surveillance that you can actually make of them. And there needs to actually be thinking of a Latin American context and what means privacy to the region itself instead of just just thinking that we need a law, so we're just going to just, you know, copy some of the same concepts and put the same into the Latin American concept and all will work the same. The same in the context of COVID, that even though it's a nice idea maybe to have tracking applications for COVID-19, if they are privacy preserving, of course, um, but maybe in the Latin American concept, it will not make sense because not a lot of people have actually access to one smartphone that they carry around all day. Is this still a need to think about the data that's consumed by other countries. Um, so mainly because the most of the people in Latin America are using social media that is developed by other countries and mainly they're using Facebook and WhatsApp. What actually means that the data gets stored in another country. We need to think about the malware market and why certain companies from global north countries are actually selling this malware and what does it mean and like what legality has that actually. Um, what we know is that malware is mainly used for targeted surveillance, specifically uh, for journalists, but it's highly used for digital gender-based violence. I know that there's a lot of studies from the Global North for how malware is actually installed for spouseware and other kind of this, but it's not that much used for gender-based violence in Latin America. In Latin America, it's mostly about hacking uh, social media accounts or like um, restricting the access to the device. We need to do more research to actually know how digital tools, in, uh, how harassment over digital tools actually impact the minorities. What actually means, for example, for um, uh, women's rights activists or LGBT AI plus activists to actually be, ha uh, be harassed all the time and monitor all the time uh, their activities uh, through digital tools. And we also need to think if there is a secure messaging solution that actually works in Latin America for activists that sometimes don't have the same level of access to technology as they do have in the global north, or the same access to the, to the internet in general, the connection of the internet as in the global north. Uh, more details around all of this will be discussed actually at a panel that I will be inviting you now all. Um, to happen maybe in January and February and to actually talk to people who have been doing all of this research um, around what actually of the findings are and what we can actually do to actually think about and a specific way to create a secure messaging solution or to think about privacy in a Latin American context. And just some time of reference, if you want to read about privacy laws and put some links here, the same for surveillance, 
uh, and the same for cohesion when I say cohesion is COVID, uh, domestic abuse, um, hate speech, gender-based violence, and all this. Um, with that, thank you very much. Um, I don't know how the questions were, but yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Sofía, yes. muchas gracias para esta presentación muy interesante. So, no, no. <laughs> thanks a lot for that really interesting uh, presentation. <clears throat> um, there is still time for uh, for some questions here. Use our RC chat. It's linked in the chat tab below in your video browser here. Um, you can also go to Twitter and Mastodon, rc3-csh would be the uh, hashtag. Um, so far, let me quickly see. Yes, no questions, but I have a couple of questions. So in the meanwhile, folks, if you're interested, send us your questions. They will be collected and forwarded by me. In the meanwhile, I have a couple of yeah, questions, let's say, um, to you until the others come up with their questions. You said um, that police treats uh, females which have been harassed when they go actually to, to indicate that there's something really going wrong as historical beings. So the question is for me, um, that's a typical, say, male reaction. So what's the, the distribution between males and females in police, in jurisdiction, like, for example, um, judges, uh, lawyers, and so on and so forth. So I suppose there is a certain in, uh, disequilibrium. No? disequilibrium. Yes, there is not a balance um, between the number of women in the police uh, and in general in the judicial system uh, in Latin American countries, even as far as going, like, for example, women presidents in Latin America are hardly a thing. I can think of an instance in Argentina, in Chile, in Brazil. Um, in my country, it has not been an Ecuadorian president, although it should have happened because there was actually an Ecuadorian woman who could have been the president, but they didn't allow her. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> but yeah, there's always a disadvantage about it, which actually asks the question if there will be women, more women in the police or in legal authorities to actually believe women. That could certainly be the case, but it could also be certainly the case that even if there were women, sometimes for women, join mostly male-dominated fields, what happens is that they um, integrate into the same uh, pattern of thinking, so they get more, so they get more easily, uh, uh, more easily, so they feel more easy, easy at comfort uh, on the work that they are doing. So that could also be that even there are women that will be still treating other women reporting that because um, they have integrated into the same male thinking just to preserve the job. Okay. Well, that's that's a sad story, obviously. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly the way it shouldn't work. Okay, we have some uh, questions flowing in. So the first one is, so what is the reason for people not thinking about their own privacy? What do you think about it? So in general, I think that in Latin America, there's still in digital tools, there's still not this notion that you are actually being surveilled and that the data that you are giving to companies actually have some kind of um, cost or that it has some kind of, uh, yeah, that it has some kind of cost. So what people think is that they only use social media as they will be using casual conversation. They think they equiparate uh, social media with that. Like for example, social media is the same as having a casual conversation with someone, meaning that after I finish this casual conversation, it will go to the air and there's no record of it. So there's this notion of that. There's still some need to actually say, no, this actually is almost as writing something into a paper because it has the same level of storage. It's, it's not like only talking, it's, it's the same. So that still needs to be actually pushed into the agenda, maybe in the same education system to actually say, the usage of social media or the usage of digital tools has indeed these actual implications. Yeah. And this still needs to happen. I don't know if it's specific to Latin America. Certainly in Latin America happens, but I think it's also in the world that people treat the usage of specifically social media and WhatsApp as if it was like, you know, casual conversations, but it's not actually the case. Great. Thanks for that elaborate answer. 
Um, oh, wow. Now it's, go it's going on. That's good. We are having the questions now. Um, can activists operate properly uh, under the circumstances that they actually know that they're being spied on? There have been some instances in which um, activists have been actually targeted and sort of been aware of this. There's a lot of journalists who have actually been aware of this. And in Ecuador, for example, what they started doing is that they were started collecting the malware that they were sent. Um, so there's like a little collection of the malware that was sent to them. And they sort of realized this. But there was no way, for example, they, they sort of figure out this later. Um, at the time, they were already targeted because most of the time people don't have access in Latin America to antivirus software because it's really expensive and your company will not pay for it. Or sometimes mm -hmm. you install your antivirus software uh, from a, uh, buying it in an illegal way, <laughs> the license in an illegal way that happens a lot in Latin America. Um, so there's no like way. License. Yeah. <laughs> um, in the cases also, sometimes when government actually targets um, political opposition or activists, they sometimes they don't know exactly how to target. So there was one instance in one, there was one judge in Argentina who got killed. And when people analyzed his phone, they found out that he had malware installed, but the malware was not functioning because... Um, because the malware was only to be used for a computer, for a desktop computer, but not for the phone. So even <laughs> the government sent this malware to try to target him, but it was not efficient because it was not for the purpose that they were wanted. So sometimes even when governments buy this malware, uh, they don't know exactly how it works, so they just only send it. Is there a way that they can keep working? There's some ways that they can still work, but most of the time what activists in Latin America use is mostly they use social media and WhatsApp, and they get infiltrated quite heavily in those group groups um, so they can try. Most of the times what they do is that they have uh, have now created like a strategy on how to efficiently use social media and how to efficiently use WhatsApp. And if they actually need to come up with certain important decisions or certain important meetings, what they do is that they gather themselves in person rather than using any kind of digital tools. So that's like a common thing that they prefer to meet in person rather than using any digital tool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is a question actually about this panel you've mentioned. Um, folks out there are not quite sure where, how to find it. So basically, if you can comment on that, that would be cool. Yeah, so I'm still thinking of exactly what is going to happen. Uh, the idea is to have been people from, the, uh, from Article 19, from Charisma, from EFF. Mm -hmm. I did something similar uh, on an event about secure messaging, but that was with activists from Hong Kong and Tibet. And this one is going to only be focused in Latin America. Um, I will put on my Twitter because that's the way I put it. Um, I usually send it also to mailing list. Last time I also sent it to the tour mailing list. Um, no. But if people have an idea of what other mailing lists I can advertise this to, I can also send it along. It's very, it's very in a hacker way in the sense that it's very self-created, nothing like advertised by big companies. So, yeah, want yeah. to know about it, get in yeah. contact. <laughs> uh, just tell us your Twitter. Uh, uh, my Twitter is uh, Klaus Sesewit. Uh, yeah. uh, just tell us. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> ah, perfect. Exactly. That's the one we need. That's the one we need. <laughs> Very good. Um, okay, let me see. We still have a little bit of time left now. Um, hmm. Maybe another question. You were talking about data retention uh, in several countries of South America. Um, are they usually then requested by judges, or do you have some some information that this actually flows? by some other weird, let's say, channels? It flows by a lot of weird channels. Uh, specifically, sometimes police itself has access to this uh, data that gets um, stored if it's important for a crime. Um, I don't know how much, for example, in companies, and that's a question to us in itself, in, for example, in the companies who have access to the data that's being stored by the same companies, if there's like some kind of internal um, internal guidelines of how actually who has access, probably not. Uh, mm -hmm. But usually the police is the one who has access or the 
or if it's in a serious crime, and a crime. When I say serious crime, I mean something that it has, it gets more like public attention or mass media attention. Um, usually, it's the prosecution. Usually, it's the judge. Those are the ones who have access. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, we also got some some tech comments here. Basically, so one person is saying, "Well, would it be, would a cheap disposable life uh, USB OS uh, be of help?" For for activists over there, for people like Tails, Ninja OS, or something like that, it will definitely be of help. Um, there has been some instances in, for example, the Tool project actually um, trying to reach out certain South uh, Latin American uh, activists and actually helping them. And I know they have been doing lots of good work around that area. With Tails, it's a little bit less because installing Tails for people is still a little bit scary. Um, and sometimes they don't really know why they need to install Tails. And most of the operating systems that I have seen <laughs> been used by activists, specifically indigenous activists in Latin America, is Windows. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's not the way. But the other operating systems, they're a little bit tougher to, to yeah. use. And plus, you said people are very, very, um, let's call it, illiterate when it comes to digital uh, communication. I mean, they are using uh, their phones and just think it vanishes in the air. So I think it's really hard to communicate yeah. um, use of those operating systems. So, <clears throat> I mean, there is also one, I mean, digital rights. Yes, that's also part of the, of the topic. Somebody is uh, wondering if there are uh, hints that manipulations were done on the level of uh, elections. Do you know anything about that? <laughs> yes, uh, specifically in Brazil, there's a really interesting cryptography by the name of Diego Araña, who actually uh, made a huge research about Brazilian elections. Um, in terms of COVID, actually, this is an interesting, really interesting question because some governments have actually been proposing to do digital um, <laughs> ways to actually elect uh, presidents. Uh, to this day, they haven't come with a good proposal. In terms of physical elections, there's always manipulation in Latin America. In my country, in Ecuador, there has been lots of scandals of actually physical manipulation of elections when they create a uh, for forge uh, ballots when they toss out some like big containers of ballots that they don't want. So even in the physical sense, there's still lots of attacks around that. Okay. Sophia, again, lots of thanks for this interesting hour with you. Uh, in the name of the audience, in my name, muchas gracias. <laughs> uh, they can actually reach you through your contacts. Now back to the studio. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Bye.